Did you think moving to the other side of the world was gonna be easy? I did when I moved to Australia over four years ago. And since then, I've spoken to over a thousand people like me who have also made the move. But it turns out moving here can be fucking difficult. And I wish that I could have done things differently to make settling into a new country a lot easier. So to make your move to Australia go a million times better, here are 20 important lessons about moving to Australia I wish I'd known earlier. I remember arriving at my first rental inspection with plenty of time to spare and thinking it would be a casual one-on-one -on -one meeting. Instead, at times I found myself in a crowd of 20 odd people, some of them clutching their applications, others with personal recommendations that they'd got from previous rentals. And I hadn't prepared bugger all. Sometimes the agent would barely even glance at me, even if I knew who that agent was. And that's when it hit me. Renting in Australia can be fiercely competitive. And sometimes you need to take a little bit of care getting your glowing references and making sure your application is up to scratch to even stand a chance. Now on my first day at work, a colleague asked me what I was gonna have for Smoko. I had no bloody idea what they were talking about and just instead nodded awkwardly. Later on, I Googled it and found out that it meant break time. Now from Arvo, Avo to even Botlo, Australians have a knack of turning even the simplest words into their own form of slang. At first, learning these skills became a little bit more of a survival skill, so as to not look like a dickhead. But after a while, you start to get it a little bit more and it turns into a bit of a fun game. When speaking to different people, moving to lots of different places in Australia, all at the same time, I find out sometimes people might be spending more than $720 a week just for a one bedroom in Sydney, versus places in Darwin, you might be able to get a three bedroom house for the same price. But these wide differences don't even have to be from city to city or even state to state. Even just 20 or 30 kilometers down the road, prices can vary widely. It made me realize how drastically living costs can vary depending on where you live in Australia. And whilst choosing the right location is really important, you definitely have to do a lot of planning and taking into consideration your budget. On one of my first drives in Australia, I quickly found myself getting beeped at while at the traffic lights. And even for the next few months, I still got caught out by the subtle differences to do with the traffic lights or the random merging of lanes. Don't get me started on the parking signs. And whilst getting your driver license in Australia can seem pretty easy, and especially coming from the UK, everything's seeming quite familiar, I quickly learned to double check pretty much everything while I was driving. Regardless of where it is that you're coming from, driving in Australia does feel a little bit strange. And you better not speed, otherwise it's gonna cost you a lot of money. But eventually, it all becomes second nature. Now, despite what people say, getting my first job was pretty easy and everything seemed pretty straightforward until they asked me where they would like my superannuation money paid into. Now obviously not knowing what the hell superannuation was, I quickly asked them if I could get back to them and after a quick google I felt completely lost. It was like contribution caps, salary sacrificing, default funds, didn't really mean anything to me. And then I quickly found out that superannuation is basically their retirement fund, which your employer pays for. And whilst there are a minefield of different ones that you can choose from, it's important that you get the right one for you. Because if you don't, it could cost you thousands. Superannuation is one of those things that no one tells you about. And the best superannuation fund is often different for everyone. So to find the best one for you, you absolutely need to figure that one out. Now I don't know why, but recently I've spent myself spending a lot of time at the doctors. Whether that's going to emergency rooms for toddlers bumping their heads, or going for quick checkups for coughs that don't seem to be going away. I've had a test, it's not COVID. Coming from the UK system where healthcare is essentially free, I was surprised the first time after I'd even handed over my Medicare card that the receptionist asked me how I wanted to pay. Even in the short four years that I've lived in Australia, I've learned that while Medicare covers a lot, not everything is free. Even if you're one of those people that says, oh, you still have to pay taxes, so it isn't free anyway. Yeah, I guess the Medicare levy is another way that you have to pay for it too. And if you find yourself having a few more health conditions than the average person, then maybe private healthcare is a good option for you too. When we first moved into our new house, within weeks we'd already been invited to an Australian's house for a barbecue. I tried to dress up a little bit for the occasion, expecting perhaps a quick meal, but instead they often turn into a whole day occasion. Sometimes with games, often with a lot of food, a lot of beers, and not really a lot of time spent in that person's house. And that's when I realized that Australians don't just love the outdoors, they live for it. And whether it's a barbecue or a beach day or going off camping, outdoor living really is a way of life in Australia. When I lived in the UK and I'd go to a coffee shop, my standard order was a black coffee with a little bit of milk in it. Why? Because it was often the cheapest thing and coffee in the UK tastes like shit. So I just wanted a bit of a pick-me-up. So when I came to Australia and asked for the same thing, I was a bit shocked to get a bit of a weird stare. Turns out here there are lots of better options that actually taste good and lots of people do it. Turns out coffee here is more of a ritual rather than just a drink that you have to eat away at the time. 
It wasn't even long before I kind of ditched instant coffee at home and bought one of those fancy coffee machines. And now I'm pretty much a flat white convert. In one of my last jobs in the UK, staying late and working as hard as you could was pretty much a badge of honour. An unpaid, thankless badge of honour. Well, in Australia, if you want to send a late night email, to have your employer request that of you, it's illegal. But even before that, many Australian employers would often tell you not to go past your working hours. Go home and enjoy your evening and your weekend. And if you're used to working hard wherever you come from, it can be a little bit of a culture shock. I mean, a nice one. Australians take a work-life balance here seriously, and it's quite refreshing. It was my first December in Australia when I wasn't really hearing as many Christmas songs as I used to on the radio. Things didn't necessarily seem so decorated, and rather than seeing people all wrapped up, it was singlets, thongs, and sometimes a weird smell of sunscreen. It really does feel weird celebrating Christmas in the summer. Fending off flies and watching you don't get sunburns, rather than sitting inside near something warm, wondering if it's too early to start drinking. But pretty soon in Australia you learn to develop new Christmas traditions. I mean, you're probably still going to eat prawns, but rather than a roast you might find yourself having more of a barbecue, or if you're a glutton for all of those types of things, why not just have them all anyway? Now if all this talk about moving to Australia has inspired you to want to make the move, but you don't know where to start, then you're going to want to speak to some of the experts. Mention that Johnson Life when you speak to True Blue Migration Services, and when you upload your resume or CV for free, they'll tell you exactly what you need to do to move to this beautiful country. If you don't believe me, follow the hundreds of positive reviews on Google, and when you realise that I'm not lying and their service is second to none, because you've mentioned us, you'll go on to save an additional $200 off the cost of your visa. I wish that when I moved here nearly four years ago, someone could offer me money off the cost of moving here, because it's bloody expensive. Speak to them today on their website at www.truebluemigration.com or check out all of their details in the description below. And if you want even more help about moving to Australia, feel free to contact us on our Instagram at that Johnston Life. Especially if you're thinking about moving to North Brisbane and you want some help finding a new place to live. I turned up to my first job in Australia in a freshly pressed suit and a tie. Fancy shoes, just wanting to make a good impression. And I quickly realised I was pretty overdressed. Apart from maybe the big boss, everyone else seemed to be in polo shirts and even the odd person had trainers on. Australians are pretty laid back, even at work, and sometimes being too dressed up, other people might look down on you a bit. It taught me that in Australia, it's more important to be approachable and friendly rather than looking formal. When we first moved to Australia, I'm not gonna lie, we felt pretty lonely. No matter how hard you try, it can feel like spending months trying to wait for friendships to happen, trying to find friends through work, joining new clubs, even using social media. It can feel like every time that you meet someone new, it's a bit of a gamble as to whether you'll find a new best friend. But when you're an adult, that's how hard it can be. Most people have already got a lot of friends. Building a social circle in Australia takes a lot of effort. But the main thing that I've found is true is that that social circle only really dies the minute you stop trying. If you want more friends, keep trying to meet new people. It's not an easy journey, but when you get it right, it's worth every step. I used to be a pretty proud person in the UK when I bought something new, when I got a promotion at work. Pretty much every time that I achieved something, it felt like it was the next step to be able to tell someone about it. But if you do that in Australia, don't be surprised that rather than getting some kind of cheer or celebration, sometimes you might receive a rather lukewarm response. And that's when I learned about tall poppy syndrome. Australians value humility, even self-deprecation, and they often shy away from overt displays of success. It's a cultural quirk that many people might not be used to. But after four years of living here, I've learned that seeking the next best thing doesn't always bring you happiness. And you'll often find a lot more joy with staying a little bit more grounded. At the shops, having a drink in the pub, or even walking down the street, you're often going to be asked in Australia, how are you? And when this first gets asked to you, you'll often mumble some kind of response, expecting the conversation to go on a little bit further, but rather than keep chatting, sometimes it just might stop. But then other times when you get asked how you're going, Australians might even keep chatting and ask you what your plans are for the weekend. And coming from the UK where no one talks to you, except maybe your closest friends and family, it felt a little bit strange at first, but it turns out that Australians genuinely enjoy a bit of small talk. It can be a bit refreshing sometimes when people genuinely want to find a bit of a way to connect with you. So if you're more used to small talk being more like a formality, then get to work a little bit on your chat and you never know who you might meet. I was excited about the prospect of my first Australia Day celebration. A day off work? Sure, why not? Some people were planning barbecues, other people were thinking about going to the beach, and some people in Australia go to attend protests. That's when I learned that the day means a lot of different things for a lot of people. Weirdly enough for me as a migrant to Australia, Australia Day to me represents a new part Part of my life. But rather than assuming that Australia Day represents the same thing for lots of different people, it's probably a good idea to approach it more thoughtfully than just assuming it's always a 
day for a piss up. When we bought our house in Australia, we moved to a suburb that we loved and got lucky finding out that the local school turned out to be pretty good. But after some research, we found out that school zoning is a very strict thing in Australia. And unless you're gonna pay for private education, choosing where you live can impact your kid's future. Now I'm not gonna lie, but we got lucky. And if we were gonna buy again in another place, we'd probably spend a little bit more time looking into schools first and then choosing where to live in the suburb after that. When I moved to Australia, my kids were very young. One of them was even born here. But my experience of watching kids grow up in the UK was that they were often glued to screens and didn't really spend a lot of time outside. In Australia, there's so much more to offer and it seems like they can't get enough of the beaches, the parks and the wildlife. My kids get more joy about riding their bikes, climbing trees or even spending time in the dirt rather than playing video games. I even bought my daughter a Nintendo to see what she'd do. All right, it was actually so I could play Mario Kart. But rather than playing it as avidly as I do, it seems that she'd rather just sit there and watch them going around the track. The environment here inspires kids to be a little bit more adventurous. And I think it also allows kids to be kids for a little bit longer. I nearly fainted the first time I saw the price of mushrooms in the supermarket. I've seen vegetables cost nearly as much as steak. But after a few months of comparing the costs of things in Australia versus the cost of what I used to pay in the UK, I realized that wages here were higher and shopping around a bit or even buying local can really save you a lot of money. It's all about adapting to the local economy, buying things when they're in season, and not trying to compare the cost of every single thing in your new life to your old one back at home. Everything here seems expensive at first, but I've not met anyone yet who's moved to Australia and found that they don't have more money in their bank account at the end of the month. I thought a quick walk down the shops I wouldn't need to put on sunscreen. Or spending 20 minutes cutting the lawn, I'd be fine in a short sleeve shirt. Don't worry if you go outside, not really used to wearing a hat. Sunglasses don't necessarily fit me, I might look a bit weird. But even for someone with my complexion, if you do any of these things, by the time you get home, you wonder why you've gone all red and everything feels tingly in the shower. The Australian sun is no joke. Skin cancer is no joke. Hats, sunscreen, shade, buying one of those little cool cabana things for the beach, they are a must. And even on a sunny day in winter, you still might find yourself hopping from shade to shade. The first time I spotted a massive spider in the corner of my living room, I panicked. I mean, that's a nice way of saying it myself. Later on, my Australian neighbors casually explained to me that it was harmless, but they do jump. The first time I saw a snake fall out of a tree with a small bird in its mouth, I also panicked. That was a green tree snake and that also apparently is harmless. It literally happened about three meters in front of me. But on the flip side, if you live anywhere rural, watching kangaroos grazing near your home, having kookaburras laugh at you in a tree, or even seeing your first koala in the wild, it made me realize how unique Australia's wildlife actually is. And while some bits can seem a bit scary, they don't really happen that often. When you're first thinking about moving to Australia, your mind is flooded with all of the negative thoughts about things that could happen. It seems like for every good reason that you have for wanting to go, there'll be two other negative reasons screaming at you for why you shouldn't. And at times you'll deliberate with yourself whether you're a strong enough person to actually make it a success. In everyone that I've spoken to that has moved to Australia, even the ones that have moved back, I've never met someone who hasn't been able to rise to the challenges of living here. If you really want to move to Australia, don't let the negative what ifs hold you back. And even if the bad things do happen and it makes you decide that you do want to move back home, then other than a little bit of finances, you're very rarely gonna be worse off for the experience. So you might as well give it a go. If I've been wrong about any of these things, then I'm sure that you're gonna tell me in the comments down below. But if you've been inspired to take the next steps with your move to Australia, then check the description down below and watch this video for some more practical tips that could help you with your move. See you next time.